Earlier in the program, we discussed the watershed moment for abortion rights in the United States. A related issue is childcare in America, which many parents will recognize as dysfunctional. Only 40% of three-year-olds are in preschool in the United States compared to over 90% in countries like France, Germany, South Korea, and the UK. Bloomberg Businessweek senior writer Claire Sutter has examined why this is the case in her recent piece. It's called How Childcare Became the Most Broken Business in America. And here she's speaking to Hari Srinivasan about her findings and how U.S. leadership should address the crisis. Christian, thanks. Claire Sutter, thanks for joining us. Um, did the pandemic make things worse in the context of childcare, or did it reveal how dysfunctional our existing infrastructure is? I think both. Um, things were kind of a hot mess to begin with, and then it made it immeasurably worse. Um, but in doing that, you know, it happened so suddenly. It, this pandemic has been lasting for so long, but if you think back to March 2020, our, our lives were upended in a matter of days or weeks. Um, and in doing that, this sudden shift is what made people realize, oh, we actually need childcare in order for our economy to function. There were attempts by the federal government to try to ease this burden on parents. Put it in perspective, uh, from the money that was handed out that reached parents, how much of child care's costs did it cover? How significant are child care costs today? It's so expensive, like so very expensive. The, the number or the fact that jumped out at me when I was researching this is the fact that in most states, putting a baby in daycare for one year, just one baby, costs more than in-state college tuition. So if you think about people early on in their careers, you know, you're having children in your 20s and 30s, and you are expected to essentially pay college tuition in order to be able to keep working. Um, that's sort of where we were before the pandemic. Infant care in some parts of the country is over $20,000 a year. It's about 13% of the average two-parent household's income with both working parents. Single parents are paying like 36% of their income, which is such a large number that you start to wonder, well, how are you affording rent, health care, you know, um, groceries? And the answer is that they're not. Um, so the money that went to sort of shore up the industry in these various COVID relief bills um, is mostly actually for providers because providers are struggling as well. But I think... All told, when you tally it up, there was about, I think, $52, $53 million, billion. But all told, that wasn't that much money compared to other industries. The CARES Act gave more money to Delta Airlines, just that one company, than the entire child care industry as a whole. And one in 55 working women in the U.S. works in early education or child care. So you have one in 55 working women in the U.S getting not as much money as Delta Airlines. It just was not enough. So how do other countries deal with this and what kinds of advantage or disadvantage does that put us in? Yeah, well, so most other countries, um, I would say America's peer countries, um, many of them have some sort of sub subsidy program in place or even maybe a, a government run system. I think that the gold standard that Everyone, when I talk to anyone in early education or childcare, always points to France. They're like, France is the best. We wish we had what France had. Um, and France has an incredibly comprehensive um, both childcare program and early education program. Um, it starts when a, a baby is about three months old um, because women in France get maternity leave fully paid. Um, and so at three months, there is what's called a, a crush system, um, and it's a, a government-run program, essentially childcare or daycare, um, that goes until a child is about three years old, um, and then they enter pre-preschool and continue on through school. Um, it's not perfect, obviously, if you talk to someone who lives in France, they have plenty of complaints. If you live in a place like Paris, there aren't enough crush spots for children. If you get a spot in the government-run crush, that's paid for. But also, if you get if you don't get one and you have to go the private route, you pay out of pocket and you get a huge percentage of that that back from the government. Um, you know, people that I talked to who actually live in France have said, you know, 
being a parent is stressful in every country. There's not a great solution to the, the parenting work-life balance. But the one thing they don't worry about is actually affording childcare. That's just off the table for them. I talked to a woman, she and her husband pay a few hundred dollars a month um, for childcare, whereas, you know, I'm in New York and I'm paying, you know, $2,000, $3,000 a month. So right now, there are efforts underway in the Build Back Better Act to try to address some of this. Is it, first of all, we don't know whether it will make it through in, and in what form, but of what is proposed today, what kind of impact would that have? That is a, a huge question, and I think the answer to that um, depends on what exactly is passed and how it is adopted and, and what state you live in, essentially. Because I think the most important thing to understand about the child care provisions within Build Back Better Act is it's not creating a whole new federal system from scratch. All it is doing is making money available to states. Should they decide to opt into the program and you know try to fix child care on their own, um, which is a, a really big ask because it's an incredibly complex problem. Um, but also, you know, we have 12 states in this country that still have not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. And I think you might expect something like that to happen with child care, where some states will opt into it, some will fix it somewhat, um, others might not quite get it right, and then others might not do it at all. So you're going to end up with a really patchwork system. And the success rate will really just depend on, you know, if states can get their act together. Best case scenario, let's say everything that the administration is asking for in terms of money towards child care gets passed. Then are we still likely to have the equivalent of like a patchwork of states doing different things? I think, you know, so the Build Back Better Act has a bunch of points in it that it says, if you're a state and you want this money, these are the things that you have to do. The ones that have gotten the most media attention and are sort of the biggest game changers are, you know, bringing down costs for parents, making child care completely free for low-income families and capping it at about 7% of a family's income. Um, given some parameters, um, and then also um, really raising the wages of, of caregivers and offering them a living wage. Um, the issue with doing this is it doesn't quite explain how a state should make this happen. So, you know, there's wording in there that, you know, a state should provide sufficient resources to providers to be able to raise their employees' wages. But the thing is, like, we have Every state has a low income subsidy program for child care that exists today. And like, yes, it's chronically underfunded. And yes, you know, only 14% of people who even qualify for it get any money at all. But there are guidelines and you have to do certain things as a state. Um, and only two states actually meet those federal guidelines. You're supposed to reimburse families at 75% um, of child care costs but most of them are, are reimbursing at 50, sometimes even as low as 25%, because there's not a, a mechanism in place to hold states accountable. And it's just not clear to me that if you just make more requirements of states, how do we know that they're going to get this right? So what's been the resistance to try and increase funding for childcare? I mean, is there a concern that we're... You know, lavishly subsidizing an industry? I mean, what's the profit margin here on, on this industry? Yeah, I think the most important thing to understand about childcare is it's so expensive because in order to offer good childcare, quality childcare, it, it has to be that expensive. So, you know, every state has requirements to be a licensed caregiving facility and they vary from state to state. But for the most part, I would say, the, the one that's like the most expensive is um, for infants, which are children two and under. Every state requires one caregiver for every three to four infants. And the reason for that is pretty obvious if you've ever had a baby, like babies need constant attention. You know, at about three or four babies, that's as much as you can watch with your actual eyes at any time. But that's an incredibly labor intensive job. So that means that if you watch babies, if you're a childcare business, you have to hire an awful lot of people. 
And so even if families are paying $20,000 a year, you have to hire all of these people and you have the average caregiver in the U.S. Um, makes about $24,000 a year, which is, you know, I talked to one woman um, in, in Portland who runs child care facilities and she says when she interviews people for jobs, you know, she's wanting to find people who are really passionate about this because she tells them, if you can go make more money being a barista at Starbucks, you should go be a barista at Starbucks. Like you need to do this because you love it. Um, and even with those low wages, you know, the U.S. Treasury a few months ago released this report sort of looking at the industry and why it's in the state that it's in. And they found that the average childcare business is only making a 1% profit margin. And that's before the pandemic. So like they entered into all of this with, you know, being shuttered for months, people pulling their children out of their their facilities and and therefore not paying them with like a one percent wiggle room like that that's why when you see these stories about a third of child care providers closed during the pandemic it's because they just couldn't make the numbers work now one of the stats that jumped out at me from your story was that today 70 percent almost 70 percent of children under six in the u.s live in a home where all available adults work i mean the scale of this is so enormous when it comes to how people figure out, they're lucky perhaps if they have a relative, a grandparent, et cetera, that might be able to pinch hit, but this is something that most American families are facing. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times in the past, the discussion, and even now, is oftentimes about women working. And that is a perfectly reasonable, and it's a discussion that we should be having, but you can also look at it from the, other perspective of the children and say 70% of kids need someone to look after them. And if we don't have affordable options for their parents and caregivers and families, whoever is taking care of them, then those kids are going to be put in situations that are not ideal. You know, I talked to parents for this article about, you know, what you do when you literally cannot afford childcare. And that doesn't mean you don't get childcare. It means that you get cheap childcare. So I talked to one woman who, you know, she was a, a single mom and going to law school when her son was two. And she, you know, looked at daycares and it was, you know, $1,200 a month or something like that. And she's like, can't do that. So she um, looked and found a, a Craigslist ad for a woman who watched children in her home for $100 a week. And she said, okay, yeah, I could do that. So she sent her kid to this woman's home and everything was fine seemingly for a while. And then one day her son came home and said that the woman had hit him. Um, so she, obviously she pulled him out um, and her story continues from there. But, you know, that's what we're talking about. It's people need child care and the lack of affordable child care doesn't just keep parents from working, but it keeps kids from having access to that kind of early education and even just, you know, kind care that children whose parents do have money, you know, have. When you talk about these small businesses, often small businesses that are daycare centers and child care centers, uh, you point out that 95% of these are owned or employed by women. 40% are women of color. Do you think this plays a role in how we think of child care policies? Oh, certainly. I mean, one thing I didn't know before I started researching this was every child care provider I talked to uh, was a woman. And also she was a woman who went into child care and opened her own business because she herself was priced out of child care with her own children. You know, there were women who were teachers or, or something like that. And and they just didn't make enough money. Their paychecks weren't big enough to cover their own cost of childcare, but they thought, I work with kids. I'll open my own business. I even talked to a woman who was 20 years into a career in the music industry, but she had two kids and was looking at over $45,000 a year of childcare costs. And she similarly also loved working with kids and was like, you know what, I'm just going to do this myself. That's not to say it's easy, but this is an industry of women priced out of other industries trying to make it so that they can care for other women's children so that those women can work. And, you know, like I said, like you said, 40% are women of color. Many of them are new to this country. 
maybe English is not their first language. These are not the people that have the ear of a senator who can get them to listen to them in the way that an airline industry, coal industry can do. Obviously, there are national organizations, but these are not people with a ton of political clout. Finally, I also wonder about how much of this like everything else these days, has been politicized. Yes, this has been politicized now, but it has been politicized, you know, for as long as we've had politicians, essentially. You know, I, th I think, um, you know, when this really started um, becoming part of the national conversation, um, first of all, it was during World War II when women um, entered the workforce in unprecedented numbers. And because there wasn't this, bias against working women at the time, because if this was your patriotic duty and you're Rosie the Riveter and you're going to save America, Congress actually got its act together and it passed um, the Land Act, which starting in 1942 created, I think it's like a little bit over 3,000 federally subsidized daycare centers in the, the U.S. for women who were working in factories and, and other wartime jobs. And they were, you know, federally subsidized, but locally administered so they could be tailored to people's needs. But the, those places only lit, existed for two and a half years because once the war ended, the funds were withdrawn and all of the centers closed. But women didn't leave the workforce and, and stop working again. Um, they continued over the decades to just enter the workforce in ever-growing numbers. And even as early as 1960, the commissioner for the Bureau of Labor Statistics there's a, he gave a speech at a conference and he sort of laid out the facts and he was like, you know, women are not only a growing part of our workforce, but they are a permanent part of our workforce. And if we don't do anything about what he called the, the daycare problem at the time, we're going to just find ourselves in, in deeper trouble by 1970 is what he was looking at. Obviously, we didn't do anything. So by 1970, it was bad. And then we didn't do anything again. And then it's gotten worse. And here we are today in 2021. And we're still talking about this. Claire Sutton, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.